in December, our story circle, the story circle of the Capital District, has a tradition where when we come together for our December meeting, we all tell some version of the same story. And in December this year, we chose the Frog Prince. And when the story was chosen, I was a little... I don't want to say disappointed, but I don't know. Frog Prince, that story doesn't do a whole lot for me, kissing frogs. And then I started researching it a little bit, and I realized um, that this idea of enchanted frogs is a very ancient story and goes back to ancient Greece and even to Australia. I don't want to say into the dream time of Australia, but it goes pretty far back into Australia. And I found two stories. And, and then I started thinking, why, do, why are we so um, fascinated by this idea of enchanted frogs? But look at frogs. They look like us, right? Why well, have generations... Well, maybe they look like you, Claire, but I've never admitted that they look like me. <laughs> well, just think about generations of children who have been dissecting frogs. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry to say. But the reason is because the frogs have most of the organs that we have, and they're in pretty much the same place where human organs are. So children can learn a lot about the human body by dissecting a frog because they think dissecting a person in eighth grade is kind of frowned upon. <laughs> so, And dissecting frogs, in my opinion, should also be frowned upon. So I started thinking about this, and it uh, occurred to me that that's probably one of the reasons we've been fascinated with these frog stories from ancient mm -hmm. times right up to Disney had an uh, enchanted frog story a few years ago. Kermit the Frog, you know, they're everywhere in our culture. So um, I found two stories that I really liked. And they're short, so I can tell one, and then we can break, and I can tell yes. another, or tell them both at the same no. time, whatever you would like. With, with a break. Well, I'll OK, I'll tell the, um, the Greek story first. OK. There's gods and goddesses for just about everything. The god of the sun the goddess of the moon, the deities that control our water and our earth. So it shouldn't surprise anyone that we have a goddess of the night. And her name is Leto. And Leto is as beautiful as her time of day or night. For me, night is probably my favorite time. I love it when it gets dark. I love when the sun sets and it paints the, the snow or the ice or the lake, those pinks and blues. I love to watch the first stars come out. And in summertime, the first fireflies as they flicker in the, in the air. So for me, night is very special. And I was so excited to learn that there is a goddess of the night. So you can imagine that Zeus, high on Mount Olympus, fell deeply in love with Leto, as he falls in love with a lot of women <laughs> throughout history and throughout Olympus and throughout the world. And Leto was just one of them. But there was something very special about Leto. And Hera became very jealous. She didn't get jealous of all Zeus's lovers. But Leto was one who touched her deep in her soul. And she feared for her own place on Olympus. And so she banished Leto from Olympus and said, no one, no god, no mortal could help her. She was banished to the earth. And she was pregnant. She was expecting a baby. And she wandered from place to place. And because of Hera's proclamation, no one could give her food or water or any sustenance or any help at all. And at last she came to a place, a beautiful pool. It was surrounded by willows. And there the people were collecting the willow branches to make, make baskets. And she saw this clear, clean pool of water, crystal clear and cool to the touch. And she reached her hand in. She was ready to drink this water. When one of the men gathering the willow branches saw her and stopped her, what are you doing? You can't be here. Be gone with you, and shoved her roughly. And then another one stepped into the pool to stir up the mud so she couldn't drink the water. And soon they were all shoving her and jumping in the water and splashing and making a mess and scaring the fish. And they were pulling up the willow, the the the. Uh, Tails and the other flowers and laughing at her. And it was then that Leto drew herself up to her full height. 
and she showed them the goddess that she was. And she said to them, you, you are now cursed. And these people who had been muddying the waters, these people who had been so cruel to her, started to grow smaller and squat and green and brown and yellow and their eyes bugged out and their mouths became wide open and their tongues reached out and catched a fly or <laughs> they hopped into that muddy water and they began to croak making awful sounds and Leto knew what they were saying asking for her forgiveness asking her to show some mercy but she would not and she left them there there in that muddy pool, there croaking, especially at night when the sun goes down and the stars come out, they make their loudest noises begging her, begging her to release them from this curse. Well, Lita wandered to the ocean and there waiting for her, sent by Zeus, was a dolphin and she climbed aboard the dolphin's back and she went through the water to an island, Delos, an island that was not fixed to the earth and therefore was not part of Hera's proclamation. And she stepped on this island. And as soon as she stepped on the island, it was anchored to the earth by Zeus. And it was there she gave birth to her twin children, Apollo and Artemis, two of the greatest gods and goddesses. And that island is still dedicated to her memory. And of course, it is sacred as the birthplace of Artemis and Apollo. So that's one of the oldest enchanted frog stories that I found. <coughs>